what's up? Because you are in the hood wood. I'm the Black Bandit KJ Green. Welcome you to another edition of Sports in the Hood Wood for May 5th, 2023. Coming up in this edition, NFL, who won the draft? Made the biggest splash. Who made the best signing? Break down some of the best moves and some of the more puzzling transactions during the NFL's silly season. NHL playoffs are underway, and the abject failure of the Bruins and Avalanche cannot be ignored by this squad. We'll take a look in depth at what two best teams in NHL are already out. A month into the Major League Baseball season, who's faking it and who's making it? Take a look at the division leaders who I think are real, who are fake champs. Also have the Hood with Hot Five, five hot questions for the NBA playoffs. That, that head slap, myriad of sports takes, information, it's been a long while. She left you with a strong beat statue, but I'm back. After a hiatus, it's sports with Hoodwood. Put on your helmet, put on your seatbelts, and let's go. time off show's been on hiatus but i am back and i welcome you wherever you may be enjoying this podcast if you're on youtube welcome always like smash that like button subscribe give us five stars and say why you like the show what i can do to improve i always um, appreciate any feedback if you're on any of the myriad of podcast providers that are carrying this show, whether it be iTunes, Spotify, um, Stitcher, it doesn't matter which one of the podcast providers that you're on, the fact that you're here is greatly appreciated. And I do know that there are people that are listening in different places in the United States and around the world, and I welcome you. Thank you for your patronage. And like I said, rate, review, throw everything out there. I appreciate your feedback. And if you do send me an email, I do write back and I do take suggestions for the show, which will read, uh, will read detail all of the ways that you can contact me at the end of the show. So once I got all that little detail and legalese out of the way, let's get started. First of all, hmm. Let's talk about the NFL, shall we? Now let's lead off with the NFL. The 2023 NFL draft has been conducted and... Everybody and their experts are throwing out grades, who picked high, who picked wrong, who picked who they shouldn't have picked. I mean, it was no real surprise, Bryce Young being the top overall pick by the Carolina Panthers. They're hoping that they get their franchise quarterback out of Bryce Young, even though I'm still really skeptical about Alabama quarterbacks. I mean, everybody knows with that Mac Jones is toiling away in New England and Tua Tagovailoa is getting his shot in Miami. Uh, Jalen Hurts, who was an Alabama quarterback, then went to Oklahoma, is taking the Eagles to the cusp of an NFL championship with the Eagles. But the jury is still out about Alabama quarterbacks, and I am not sold on Alabama quarterbacks. And though Bryce Young has shown poise and precision, to keep Alabama near the top of the college football rankings. The pro game is going to be a such a bigger 
monster to slay. Now, I think he has tools and talent with Frank Reich as his head coach, former quarterback that I think will have the patience to give him the tutelage to become a top-flight quarterback. But the jury will still be out. Frank Reich flunked out in Indianapolis, even with a top-flight quarterback, although agent, in Matt Ryan. Like I said, the jury is still out. Now, the Houston Texans jumped on C.J. Stroud and was able to get Will Richardson from Alabama in the two and three slots, which surprised no one. It kind of surprised me the Texans uh, traded up to get the uh, standout Alabama defense event. But a lot of people think he may have been drafted too high. Anthony Richardson got, got picked up by the Colts. Kind of surprised there. I was... A lot of people were either really, really on board with Anthony Richardson, or they really was like, "No, no, no, he's going. He's he's got bus written all over him." I think the jury is still out on him. I think that if developed the right way, as one of my longtime antagonists and colleagues, Ken LeBlanc, likes to say, which he doesn't believe any NFL coach can develop a player the way he thinks they she they should be. And I'll have him on the show one of these days to discuss this. But if coached the right way, if brought along the right way, I think Anthony Richardson could develop into a decent quarterback. But there's a new regime in, 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 in Indianapolis, and there's going to be pressure to put him on the field right away. And I don't think that's going to be a good thing. I think he needs to develop. I think he really needs to be brought along slowly, cultivated, and brought along where he doesn't have to feel the pressure to have to win games right away. A quarterback who fell painfully was Will Levis of Kentucky. And it was sad to see him sitting in the green room as team after team after team after team passed on him. Once they got down to, like, Minnesota and Philly and Kansas City, you knew it was a wrap. You knew they weren't going to take him. And he just had this poor look like he's watching millions of dollars fly out the window and he's watching his stock fall just dramatically. Now, Levis did get picked up by the Tennessee Titans in the second round. But a lot of people are sitting back thinking, you know, did people think he was a little overhyped? I thought he was a little overhyped. I didn't think he was a first round pick to begin with. But there were some people who were saying, oh, Will Levis, he, he, could be, he could be the top choice. He could be a franchise quarterback. And they build him up. And a lot of teams were like, nah, we're good. We, 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 ain't, we, ain't, really, we ain't really down with him. And his stock fell further and further. And the only one that I could compare that, the way his stock was falling, was from 40 years previous, when Dan Marino fell and fell and fell, but he fell into the laps of the Miami Dolphins, a team that was already pretty good. And he took them to the Super Bowl two years later. Now, I don't think Will Levis can do the same thing with, with Tennessee. They've got a few flaws of their own. But in comparison, the problem with Dan Marino was he had unfounded and very unfair rumors about drugs and it scared a lot of teams off and and if you ever get a chance to see the documentary uh kelly de marino it's a fascinating i beg i beg pardon uh elway de marino i said kelly i was thinking jim kelly another quarterback in that uh quarterback famed quarterback class of 1983 40 years previous but you watch the the way dan marino was more or less hung out to dry. And his own hometown Pittsburgh Steelers didn't want him, even though he was a local kid, played at, at, at University of Pittsburgh, it would have been a perfect fit for that team. Don't you think the Steelers would, in hindsight, would have loved to have the hometown kid throwing bombs and lasers for the Steelers and keeping that team relevant in the 80s? The Steelers went... Shoot, almost 20 years before they got a really good franchise quarterback after Terry Bradshaw, chump, retired. 
But Will Levis fell and fell and fell until the Titans picked him up. There are a number of good players that got picked up in the first round. And a lot of players that got passed over didn't even get drafted. Ivan Pace Jr. from my alma mater, University of Cincinnati, All-American, didn't get drafted. Now, the Minnesota Vikings picked him up as an undrafted free agent, and I think he will be a real steal for them. But there were a lot of players that you were wondering, hmm, why didn't this player get picked up? Or what, or what are we seeing? I think there was too much stocks taken in the, uh, too much faith taken in the, the, the combine and not looking at film. People got too married to, oh, he had such great numbers at the combine. Let's see how, how well it's gonna, gonna be how it's gonna pan out. Now, of course, we've all had we've all seen the big names getting picked up. Jimmy Garoppolo to the Raiders, Derek Carr to the Saints, and what's the one guy's name? Uh, uh, Rogers. Uh, Aaron Rodgers to the Jets. Now, does this make these teams noticeably better? I'm still not sold on the Jets being being a Super Bowl contender. They've got offensive problems. And as much as I like Robert Saleh, I still am not buying into the Jets being an instant contender. Even with Aaron Rodgers. And I think Aaron Rodgers, while he may make the Jets a decent team, I still think the Jets have way too many holes to be an instant Super Bowl contender. The jury's still out on that. Let's take a time out. Come back. Talk about the NHL. The failures of the Boston Bruins and the Colorado Avalanche team with the record number of points and the defending Stanley Cup champions. Both of them bounced in the first round on their home ice in a seventh game. That needs a deep dive. And we'll take a look at it. Sports with Blue Book comes back at you after this. Is today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason. You need us at gottagetmarriednow.com. We specialize in last-minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at gottagetmarriednow.com. find out that I am a hockey fan. I enjoy the sport of hockey. It's best watched live, to be perfectly honest. But I've been to many an NHL venue from the old Joe Louis Arena to Nationwide Arena in Columbus to St. Louis, Chicago, Minnesota. And all the games that I have seen live have been really crackerjack affairs. And, and the speed and grace and power in these in these games, I, again, I say it's best witness live. But Stanley Cup playoffs started a couple weeks ago, and there have been just some really stunning developments. The Boston Bruins, 135 points, NHL record, 65 wins, and many people were debating, you know, were these one of the greatest teams in NHL history? But it wasn't 65 wins that you need that you garnered in the regular season, it's the 16 you need to hoist Lord Stanley's Cup. And facing the wild card two, or I still say the eighth seeded, Florida Panthers, who had 92 points, far below the, the record-setting pace the Bruins had, most people thought the Panthers were going to be pretty much roadkill for the rampaging Bruins. Top seeds are supposed to breathe hard in the first round. You know, most people expect a sweep, 
five game. If it goes six game, people are still think, thinking you're a little suspect. And the Bruins raced out to a three games to one lead. You know, they won. They split the first two games in Boston. Many people going, ooh, the Panthers might. But the Panthers fell both times in Florida. The Bruins taking a three games to one lead going home to Boston. Many people thought, that's a wrap. The, you know, the, the, the Panthers aren't going to win twice in Boston, much less come back from a 3-1 lead. Uh-uh-uh. The Panthers decided they were going to extend the series, winning 4-3 to in overtime in Boston. Series goes back to Miami, or Sunrise, Florida, wherever the Panthers are, somewhere in the Miami area. Right? But regardless of which, the Panthers slapped around the Bruins in Game 6, outgunning them 7-5. to so now it's game seven going back to Boston. And many people thought, nah, the Bruins ain't going to ruin it. They ain't going to mess this up. And with less than two minutes to play in the third period, the Bruins had a 3-2 to two lead. A shaky 3-2 to two lead, but they were holding on. And the fans in the TD North uh, Bank Center were nervous but they're thinking, okay, we'll get us a scare, but it'll be all right. Why did the Panthers tie the game up with 37 seconds to play? And you could just see all the Bruins fans going, no, 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 no. Game goes into overtime. And the way the Bruins looked in that overtime game, in that seventh game, with as much to lose as they had in that game, they played soft, they played casual, and the Panthers cashed in on a game-winning, series-winning overtime goal. And it looked and sounded like a moor in Boston. This was supposed to be the Bruins' year. Funny nobody told the Panthers that. The Panthers move on to the second round, winning four games to three, overcoming a three games to one deficit to move on to the second round against... <laughs> the Toronto Maple Leafs, who ousted the Tampa Bay Lightning in six games. No, don't worry, hockey fan. Tron is going to find a way to mess this up. They always mess this up. They have, they, yeah, they, they have 111 points. Yes, it was their first playoff series win since 2004. But you really think that the, the Maple Leafs are going to go deep into the playoffs? An oceanfront property in Kansas I, you might be interested in. Out west, you had the defending champion, Colorado Avalanche. They had hoisted Lord Stanley's Cup last year and were supposed to be against playoff neophyte Seattle crackheads. I, I mean cracking. I can't stop, can't stop calling them crackheads because they got the respect that they were due by taking the fight to the avalanche. And I'm watching this series and I'm going, now, sooner or later, Colorado's going to realize, hey, we're the better team. Hey, we can't let these guys roll over us like that, even with the crack and winning in Denver in game one. The, the, the avalanche won the next two games, and people were thinking, okay, you know, stability is going to be restored. But then the Kraken win games four and five to take a three games to two lead. The series goes back to Seattle. Avalanche stomp the Kraken. And you're thinking, okay, okay, the Avalanche are going to basically go home, even though this shouldn't have went seven games against a play. First time the Kraken had made the playoffs. This is only their second year. Why did the Kraken win two to one? in Game 7, in Denver, and send the Avalanche home. The abject failures of the Bruins and the Avalanche in the first round against teams that they had that had no business getting them to a seventh game, much less beating them on their ice. It's going to be a long spring and summer for these teams and the Bruins are facing a lot of personnel changes. A lot of players are facing retirement or moving on in free agency. They're not going to be able to run the band back again. 
Now, the the other series, of course, the 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 Wild losing to the Stars. They seem to always be jinxed by that Dallas team. The L.A. Kings, phew, absolutely getting just tortured and, and slaughtered in, in by the by the Edmonton Oilers and, and the Vegas Golden Knights. Why are the Vegas Golden Knights so good? Somebody answer me that. Somebody answer me that. Will there be a Canadian team win Roising Lord Stanley's Cup for the first time in 30 years? A Canadian team has not won a Stanley Cup since the Montreal Canadiens beat Wayne Gretzky and the LA Kings. That's how far back it goes. I'm not banking on a Canadian team, especially not Toronto. I, I, I make fun of them all the time. I don't find a way to mess it up. Edmonton will find their way to mess it up. And you'll have another Canadian team and another abject failure by the Canadian team. Time out. Come back and look at the Major League Baseball. Who's faking it and who's making it? A month in. Sports Global continues after this. Is today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason, you need us at GottaGetMarriedNow.com. We specialize in last-minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at GottaGetMarriedNow.com. Once again, here's the man of the hour, After Hours, your host, K.J. Green. You're back in the Hoodwood. My name's K.J. Green, and a month into the Major League Baseball season, we are, and you want to take stock and kind of say the, uh, I won't call it the quarter pole, I would say more of the fifth pole, it's about fifth way of the season, about, most teams have played about 20, 25 games. And you want to see who's really you know, taking a claim on playoff spots. I mean, it's not too early to think about teams who are real contenders for the playoffs. So I have divided the eight teams that I think can make the playoffs into what I call faking it and making it. No, I'm not going to bust out with the old 72 making it. I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with that. But we're going to look at the division leaders as of Wednesday, May 3rd, and see what teams I think are real and which teams are unreal that are going to be, and they can't sustain this over the course of 162 seasons. We'll start with AL East and the Tampa Bay Rays, who I feel are making it. This team is no joke, people. I mean, they started out... 13-0, and 
winning just crazy, just in just dominating fashion at home, 24 and 6. It's the Rays are for real people. They're, they are first in the AL, probably first in, in, in Major League Baseball in runs, batting average, on base percentage slugging percentage and it goes into pitching too they're first in the in the major leagues in earn run average whip opposing batting average this is a team that is scary balanced and they're young they're hungry you got you got a cat like Randy Rizrana who is just hitting the ball like nobody's business and this is a team that fears nobody and wants to stake their claim this is a team I think is for real there in the making it class. AL Central, I know you're going to say I'm biased because of the Twins banner up over my shoulder, but the AL Central leaders are the Minnesota Twins. I think they're another making it squad. Now, this is a team that has good pitching. Start out with Sonny Boy Gray. Tyler Molly is on the disabled list for a short stint, but they do have good pitching top to bottom. Now they're hitting. Eh, their hitting is a little spotty. They were still waiting for Byron Buxton to get, get rolling, Carlos Correa. They, those are guys that you're waiting to really pick up pace. And Joey Gallo, is he still in this league? Yeah, he's still in this league and he's still hitting pretty, he's hitting pretty decently. Still strikes out way too much. But as long as the Twins have their hitting and that solid pitching, with the weak AL Central, 90 wins should be good enough to win this division. I think they're making it. Now, the AL West leaders right now are the Texas Rangers. I think they're faking it. This is a team that got swept by the lowly Cincinnati Reds. Come on. You're supposed to be a division leader. You're supposed to be able to sweep away weak, super weak teams like the Reds with hardly a sweat. They lost all three games in walk-off fashion. And the Reds, who aren't scaring anybody this year, next year, anytime in the near future, made them look silly. This is not a team I believe is built for the long haul. I think they're faking it. Now, the wild cards, the Toronto Blue Jays, I think are making it. I think they'll be in hot pursuit of the Rays pretty much the balance of the season. But I think that they can pass the other team that I think is right now leading the wild card, the Baltimore Orioles who at 20 and 9, I don't believe in in the, in the least. I think they're doing it with mirrors. They're maybe a year away. I think they're faking. Turning to the National League, the leaders in the NL East are the Atlanta Braves. Come on. The Braves are playoff pedigree, playoff tested. They're making a team. Now, will they do with the Mets? Probably. But they have their usual litany. Good pitching, good hitting, and a solid team all the way around. I think the Braves are a good enough team to make the playoffs. In NL Central, you have the Pittsburgh Pirates. I think they're faking it. This team has been beating up on weak teams pretty much the early part of the season. Can they hold off the hard-charging Brewers, a playoff-tested team, to establish dominance in the NL Central? I don't think so. I don't think they can keep this this pace up. I think they're faking it. And in the NL West, you have LA Dodgers. What would the playoffs be without the LA Dodgers? They've won the division nine of the last ten years. They're making it. I mean, yeah, everybody likes to talk about the Padres and the, how they can push the Dodgers, but let's keep it real. The Dodgers are a solid team all the way around. Start with Mookie Betts. Start with that great pitching that they've got. The Dodgers are a team that's going to be making it. Now, the wild cards, I have the Brewers, a team I say is making it. That's another solid team. They, they'll they push the Pirates, and I think they can catch and pass the Pirates. Still early, but the Brewers are a solidly built team. The other wild card right now is the Arizona Diamondbacks. I think they're faking it. This is not a team that's built for the long haul. They've been playing well as of late, but they haven't played a lot of the, the stronger teams in the NL West. It comes around, they have to play the Dodgers and the Padres, fall apart. So, that's who I think the teams are making it, or the teams I think are faking it. What do you think? Let's take another time out. Come back with the Hood Wood Hot Five, Fat Dab Head Slap, and the final word from the Wood. Of course, the Hood Wood heads down the home stretch. 
this. Is today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason, you need us at gottagetmarriednow.com. We specialize in last-minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at gottagetmarriednow.com. Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for no-nonsense commentary, insight, and opinions on the world of sports. Here now live in living color, black by popular demand, your host, KJ Green. Running third, and and the final word from the Now, I've had people ask me, where's the Hoodwood Hound? I think he's out somewhere chasing birds or something because it's a fairly nice day out here in the Hoodwood. But while I work, he plays, but he left me, he fetched some questions. The Hoodwood Hot Five. Five topics, and this week's topic is the NBA playoffs. Question one. Are you really that dumb? Jeez. Oh, Why does he always sneak these dumb questions in here on me? Anyway, question number one. Did Joel Embiid win the MVP or was it Joker fatigue? Joker fatigue? I don't know. Joel Embiid winning his first Most Valuable Player Award, the first sixer to do so since... Allen Iverson 22 years ago, winning the MVP at a close vote over Nikola Jokic, whom I thought was a thinking man's choice to win his third straight Most Valuable Player Award. But many people thought, okay, we're tired of, uh, of Nikola Jokic winning the Most Valuable Player and doing nothing in the playoffs. Let's put this playoff jinx on somebody else and see if Jokic can make his way through the playoff round. Joel Embiid played an absolutely monster season. I mean, the, the stats show out that he was a team, a player who carried the Sixers and are carrying them in the playoffs. Now, James Harden is playing very well for the Sixers as an ancillary piece, but free of the shackles of Ben Simmons, I think Joel Embiid has shined for the Sixers, and I think was a deserving MVP. Was it Jokic's fatigue? I don't think so. I think Embiid deserved the MVP. Question two. Speaking of Nikola Jokic, are the Nuggets for real? Now, the Nuggets swept aside my poor Timberwolves in a gentleman's sweep, beating them in five games, and have basically slapped around the Phoenix Suns in the first two games of the Western Conference semifinals. That being said, do I think that the Nuggets can get by either the Warriors or the Lakers in the Western Conference finals? And I, particularly, I don't think so. I don't think the Nuggets, even though they have a great team, Jokic, Murray, Gordon, they're a solid team top to bottom. But in the playoffs, they have seemingly not had that ability to hit that next gear and to go deeper into the playoffs. And with a team, like I said, either the Lakers or the Warriors waiting for them in the next round, I don't. I just can't buy into the Nuggets being a really real team to get deep into the playoffs. That's another number one seed that I just don't believe in. Like the Milwaukee Bucks failing in the first round against the Heat, the Nuggets, when pushed, may not be able to sustain that their winning ways. Question number three: Who's Tabari McCoy? Are you going to? Say? Oh, my friend Tabari McCoy is going to be performing. Check out his stuff on YouTube. If you haven't had a chance to check out a lot of his comedy stuff, please do so. 
little plug. I'm going to be talking to him soon about stuff like sneakers and Seattle baseball and stuff like that. So stay tuned for that coming soon. Question number three. Are the Lakers a real dark horse? The Lakers are like share cockroaches. They just don't know how to go away. You can't kill them off. The Lakers toyed with the Memphis Grizzlies, winning in six games. That team, the Grizzlies, should be ashamed of themselves. They were they just were exposed as the frauds that they were. Now everybody's talking about, oh, the Lakers are a dark horse. They're a seven seed. Nobody wants to play them. And after the game one just beating of the Warriors. Yeah, the, the Lakers only won by five, but they dominated that game. The, the Warriors had to fight back just to get back within single digits, but the Lakers dominated the game in San Francisco and stole home court advantage. Are they a dark horse? Can, if LeBron and Anthony Davis can both stay healthy, this is a team that no one wants to deal with in the playoffs. This is a battle-tested team. This is a, uh, I mean, at least with LeBron James and Anthony Davis are two players that you can bank on. We're healthy to make, make series that much more of a dogfight, that much more of a slugfest. And a team like this is just not a team you want to be in front of. They can dominate the inside, and they made the Golden State Warriors play an inside-out game and not an outside-in game. And the Warriors, we all know, cannot play on the inside. They don't have that dominant inside. Andrew Wiggins, eh, he's decent. But I still cannot look away from the Lakers. Are they a true dark horse? You might have to get used to seeing them in late May and June, people. It's a hard reality. Question number four. <laughs> Can we trust the Knicks? No. I'm sorry. Ignore the bleedings you hear from Stephen A. Smith. Ignore the bleedings you hear from the ESPN-driven and Fox-driven media outlets. The Knicks are not a real team yeah they slapped around the cavaliers but the cavaliers seemed like they were afraid when they got in the playoffs they were intimidated by the madison square garden crowd miami not so much yeah i know miami was an ac but did you see what they did to milwaukee did you see what they did to that strong team the heat are afraid of no one now i know i know in this round, the Heat should be a dominant team. You see Kevin Love throwing these 80-foot two-handed passes to, 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 for, for runaway breakout layups. The Heat will get theirs. Now, do I think the Heat can get deep in the playoffs and maybe win a title? No. <laughs> we all know Jimmy Butler's going to gonna all of a sudden go to his me-first attitude and self-destruct the any team he's done, he's done it for. He did it in Chicago. He did it in Minnesota. He did it in Philly. He's done it to Miami before. I cannot bank on Jimmy Butler getting deep into the playoffs. But for this round, I think he's good to go. Are the Knicks a team you can trust? No. I don't care that Julius Randle has been playing good. I don't care that Jalen Brunson has been playing good. I don't care. The Knicks are not to be trusted. If you trust the Knicks and they break your heart, don't say I didn't warn you. Question five, is the, I can read it upside down, there we go, is the Celtic Sixers the real Eastern Finals? I don't see why not. The Celtics and the Sixers are two of the best teams. I still say the sleeper teams in the East. Everybody talked about Milwaukee being the number one seed, but the Celtics and the Sixers, I thought, were the two teams that could have given the Bucks trouble. Well, the Heat took care of the Bucks, so on that side of the bracket, you have the Celtics and the Sixers playing in the Eastern Semis. Should be the Eastern Finals, but they're the two and three team, so they're facing off. I always thought that the, 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 the playoffs should reseed every round, that the, top, the highest seeded team should face the lowest seeded team left. 
But in this case, you're going to have two of the strongest teams facing each other in the conference semifinals, which I think is a shame because the Celtics and Sixers series is going to go seven. Even though MB and Harden are playing out of their minds, I still think the Celtics have just enough moxie to push this series to seven. I'm giving a slight edge to the Sixers, and I'm hoping Harden doesn't do this, have one of these game seven self-destruct mode games. But I'm going to bank on the Sixers this time. That's my hot five. What's yours? Now, let's look at our fat dap and our head slap of the week. Our fat dap of the week goes to Erling Haglund. I hope I said that right. My apologies to Premier League fans if I misspelled it, mispronounced his name. But he stood out. Boy, does he stand out, scoring his 35th goal of the Premier League season, breaking the all-time single-season record that was held by Andrew Cole and Alan Shearer in the 3-0 win for Man City over West Ham on Wednesday. Now, the record has been set with five games left in the season. He did it in his 33rd game. I mean... People are going, okay, so we scored 35 goals. But think of it like Wayne Gretzky when he scored 50 goals in 39 games. He's done it so far ahead of schedule. And the kid is only 22. This record is older than him. The records were set in the 93, 94, and then matched in the 94, 95 campaigns by Andrew Cole and Alan Shearer, respectively. These were done in the 90s. Haglin is 22. 22! He set these records. These records were the original records were set five years before the boy was even born. And he has reached the unreachable star. Fat dap to Haglin. And, man, he's the reason why Man City sits atop the Premier League table. Now, our head slap goes to the Major League Baseball players who have been incessantly whining about these rule changes. The pitch clock. The uh, the player having to be in the batter's box within a certain time. The bigger bases. All of these have been designed to speed up the game and many people say well baseball is is a timeless game it doesn't need a clock it didn't need a clock but it needed some tweaking it needed a little bit of urging along now i love baseball you know i could sit at a baseball game all day and don't have to worry about time or anything but when games when nine inning games are going four hours there's something wrong with it now, baseball games are running about two and a half hours. The time has been taken off of Major League Baseball games for simply making the pitchers pitch quicker and the batters stay in the batter's box. Now, the bat, now they've also taken away the shift. So there are more hits. There are more line drive hits and seeing eye singles. What's wrong with this being, what's, what, what is wrong with that? For the game, I think it's cleaned up the game, made it crisper, more streamlined, and Major League Baseball players better just go ahead and get used to it. Like the DH, these rules are here to stay, and I like them. Now, without much further ado, let's go to the final word from the wood. Man, MLB season still in its infancy, early early days. It's, it's typical and should be customary to feel some sort of optimism for your favorite team, whether it's new acquisitions or a soft playoff run to build on from the previous year, or just the feeling that this is your team's year, the year that it finally all comes together for a World Series championship. But then there are fans of the Reds, A's, Nationals, Rockies, Royals, and other mid to small market teams 
whose owners are already crying poor and swearing they simply do not have the money to compete with other larger, better funded teams. They quietly curse under their collective breaths when they see owners like the Mets Steve Cohen shell out prodigious amounts of money on players. They claim that they cannot do the similar things and wonder, often out loud, why they should be obligated to spend their money on players that they feel that will soon leave them. They would rather sit back and complain that these cities that they're in should be spending money on them, that the patrons should feel blessed and lucky that they have a major league team, that these fans should still be coming out and supporting this team, no matter what product they put on the field, and that they put money out if these same fans come out. These fans, that they are still quick to label as fickle, and that they openly opine that it makes no sense that they should throw tons of money out when the fans won't come out. Now, I hear this argument from the Castellini family, who has owned Red since 2006, whose pernicious ways have more or less shipwrecked a once proud and dominant franchise. This team has gone into full rebuild mode. And after losing 100 games for only the second time in franchise history in 2022, is telling its fans it needs to stay the course, keep the faith, and keep quiet while they rebuild the team. But you have a feeling that once this team starts to develop worthy players, that they will once again cut the roster, claim the poor, and let the other teams walk to other uh, the richer teams, or just trade them away. Never mind that every team in Major League Baseball gets upwards of $200 million off the top in revenue sharing. Never mind that the financial health and growth of Major League Baseball has never been more plentiful. The game has never been more healthier. There are some MLB owners that are more worried just about the bottom line. How much money there is going into their pockets. Now, baseball always has been and always will be a business, first and foremost. There are owners who are more worried about the profitability of the game and their franchises and will continue to cry poor that they aren't making money. Now, keep in mind, it's not about making money. It's about how much money they make. And they will claim that they are losing money even if they don't make as much money as they did the year before, as much money as they think they should make, even if they turn a profit. Owners turn a profit. Don't let them tell you it's different. They want the penance, they want the full houses, but at the same time, they don't want to spend any more money than any more money they have to. And in truth, Owners would just like to make the playoffs and do just well enough to turn a tidy profit. Put that money into their pockets, and certainly not give any more to the players, certainly not plow it back in their own team to keep their franchise playoff bound. So for a majority of these teams, they sell the sunshine, they sell the blue sky of the coming season, all knowing full well that they have no intention of competing or putting a competitive product on the field. They whine they can't compete, but they are never hesitant to cash those revenue sharing and media checks and put that money into their pockets. And it's a shame that there are teams that have no chance of competing in the short term, much less long term. And it's a shame when you know that your team already knows that they're not going to play any meaningful games past Easter or maybe Memorial Day. But as long as there are teams like the Yankees and Mets who are spending willy-nilly, they can point to them and complain that they can't spend like them to win. Now, they can spend. <laughs> they just don't want to spend their own money. It would make good business sense to them. The hell with their civic duty. It's all about the bottom line. And if it ain't making them dollars, it ain't making sense. And that is the final word from the wood.
Now with the music coming up in the background, you know that means that your time here in the Hoodwood is just about done, and I thank you so much for your visit. Now the show's email is kjgreen at sportsmanhoodwood.com. Please send me emails regarding show topics, both past and future, questions, comments on the show, and both praise and criticism. You welcome your correspondence, and we'll try to get back to you as quickly as I can. The show's website is sportsfromthehoodwood.com. That is a back catalog of the show dating back 10 years in both audio and video forms. So you can check that out if there are any shows that you may have missed. You can join the debate and conversation on the Sports from the Hood with Facebook page. You can check that out. It has plenty of great sports debate, funny stuff I find on the web, and other topics. I post often there and do respond to member posts frequently. Video versions of the show are also on YouTube. Please hit that subscribe button, smash that like button for more great content. The link to this podcast as well as on the Twitter feed at Woodwood Sports. It has a host of interesting other stuff I find in the tweet show and we do tweet back. So you can like and follow there as well. Now the audio version is also on Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iTunes from Apple, and a host of other fine podcast platforms and providers. If the Hoodwood is not on your favorite, ask for it. Drop me a line and I'll see what I can do to get it posted there as well. As always, special thanks to Rage Pictures for providing production assistance to both the show and website. So that's it from the Hoodwood, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Until next time, fellow sports fans, I'm KJ Green. 30. Sports from the Hoodwood is a Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises presentation of a 551 Audio and Films production.